today on Ask This Old House. I'll share with you a few ways to use ornamental grasses in your landscape. I noticed that this beam under our deck has fallen. It seems like a pretty dangerous thing. So I was hoping you could help me fix it up. This deck joist fell down. I'll explain why and how to fix it. Everybody wants the washing machine up in the living space, but it can flood the entire house if a washing machine hose bursts. I'll show you how you can prevent it. And we'll discuss some of the changes we're seeing with electric vehicle chargers. Just like your cell phone, when you put it down on top of the, uh, the charging mat, it charges without you having to plug it in. You're the only electrician I know who's looking forward to the day when there's no wires. <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> you know what's coming your way, pal. I still have to power the piece. One of my favorite plants to use in the landscape are ornamental grasses. Ornamental grasses add so much to a landscape design. There's so many different elements like texture, form, height, and not to mention they are beautiful when they're blowing in the breeze and you get the sound of the rustling leaves. There are many different kinds of grasses you could use in the landscape and it depends on what kind of element you want it to be. Uh, this one is called a miscanthus grass. It gives that more vertical element. It goes up and then it cascades over. And in the fall, they get these plumes or inflorescence and those are a different color, mauve color, and they sway in the wind. But this keeps a nice habit and it's a very structural plant. So this is another miscanthus, another maiden grass. The other one's morning light, and this is miscanthus adagio. Uh, the habit on this, it arches down lower, it doesn't get as upright and fountain over, and it just adds a different element to the landscape. These are the uh, inflorescence, the plumes. Uh, they come out in the late fall, just adding another element to its beauty. This one is called switchgrass. The Latin name is panicum. It's native to North America, and it has a strict upright habit. This one grows to about three to four feet tall. They look really incredible in swaths, in meadows and prairies. The plumes, or the inflorescence on this one, uh, has a different texture, a different shape. Uh, I like to plant them with hydrangeas and black-eyed Susans when you think of like piecing perennials together. It's beautiful. This one is the Hakona Kloa grass. It adds a beautiful element to a shade garden. A lot of people think you can't get color in a shade garden, but this really gives it a pop up in a dark spot in the garden. I like to pair it with ferns and hostas. It stays this height, like 12 to 15 inches. It cascades over. These are two different varieties. This one has a solid color to the blades, and this one is variegated. Definitely one of my favorites. So ornamental grasses thrive well in full to part sun, and they really like to have well-drained soil. The only maintenance you really have to do is cut it back once a year. Late winter, early spring is the best time before the new growth emerges. You go in with hand pruners or hedge trimmers about two inches high. With a little bit of care and maintenance, an ornamental grass is a great addition to any landscape. Hey, hey Ross. Hey, How's Kevin. It going? Look at you guys. Electric cars? Is that today's topic of discussion? Uh, yeah, EV chargers. Really? All right. I'll join you. So where are we going with EV chargers? I mean, these things are getting popular, right? We're, We're getting more and more of a call every day to put these in. I mean, a lot of people are buying the vehicles and, you know, they want the larger chargers to be installed in their homes. We're getting calls from car dealerships to install newer systems because they're anticipating more and more vehicles having them. And are those calls because people have bought a car and they need to charge them, or are they future-proofing their garage? A lot of times they're just anticipating buying the car. They're kind of getting ready and making sure that they're set up that they can actually use it the way they want to use it. Right. Is, is there a... Is there like a code? Is there something you have to do? Or is this always above and beyond if homeowners saying, come back and fix my garage? So something like this is above and beyond. There is a basic code. Some of our code has changed in anticipation of cars becoming more and more popular for uh, electric vehicles. And what they've done is they've basically had us install a dedicated 20 amp circuit for at least one receptacle in each garage bay. Each garage bay. And a 20 yeah. amp, that's a, just a traditional plug that I'd plug a exactly. fan into or something like that. That you'd use something like a level one charger on. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, so a level one charger would be your 120 volt regular plug, 15 or 20 amps. Mm -hmm. That's gonna give you about four to five miles per hour of charge. 
Not that's much. Not much. Not a whole lot. Uh, even overnight, that's not going to get me 100 miles. No, no. So not, not going to be great. But if you want to go to the next level, it's level two. That would look like this installed in the wall or something like this. All right. And, and this is more what we've been installing in anticipation of this coming along, is we try to future-proof it as much as we can by installing these in the garage now. What is this? This looks like a dryer plug to me. Yeah, so that's a 240 volt, 50 amp yeah. uh, plug. There's also a 30 amp version of that. So the 50 amp is kind of equivalent to an electric oven. The 30 amp is equivalent to an electric dryer. So code doesn't require this. Code requires a typical receptacle, one in each bay. Correct. If you guys were advising somebody, you would say go with something like Start this. Start with something like this. That's and, right. and how much am I, what would you do, hours, miles per yeah, hour? Yeah, so, so this, this rate, a level two typically will give you 15 to 30 miles for every hour that's plugged in. So overnight, I could get 200, 300 miles. Yeah, now we're talking about if you're commuting, if you're tra traveling yeah. any distances, that's what you're going to need. You, you, you need level to recharge the vehicle Fill up way. the whole battery. Exactly. Right? Do everything you need every mm -hmm. night. There are level three, though, by the of way. Of course there are. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three. It goes to 11. Uh, so level three would be what you see at those rest areas, right? So those are the DC superchargers. Those are the ones that run on 480 volts, super high uh, voltage, super high amperages, um, and those can charge in 15, 15 to 30 minutes. minutes. Yeah, they can bring your the car right The entire car. Yes. Yeah. Wait, are, would you put that in your garage or is <laughs> no. that? No, no. right? No. That's a that's yeah. a commercial type of thing. Yeah, that's but you'd want that as a commuter to stop somewhere. And you'd want to know where they are. So you, as you're traveling, you can make a stop, recharge quickly and keep moving. That's right. You know, a traditional outlet, 120, Maybe I could do it myself, run a couple circuits right into the bays. This, am I doing myself? This gets a little more complicated and has a few more codes that have to go along with it. So for something like this, I'd say you really want to call a professional. It's, it's much larger wire, larger amperage, larger voltage, uh, and more rules around it as far as getting this protected properly and having this installed like a should Not DIY. Not no. DIY, no. right. No. This is a, an electric car charger. That is a level yeah. two. That's, yep. that's going to go in right there, and then that's specific to the car. That's right, exactly. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So I could call you to put that in. What am I going to be calling you to do in five years or ten years? Like, what's coming our way? Yeah, so we're really excited about, that's what we are talking about before, this some of the really future stuff technologies. Yeah. So one of the things we've talked a little bit about before that I'm really looking forward to is the induction charging. Just like your cell phone, when you put it down on top of the, uh, the charging mat, it charges without you having to plug it in. You're the only electrician I know who's looking forward to the day when there's no wires. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> you know what's coming your way, pal. I still have to power the piece. <laughs> okay. So you have the induction, whether it's a pad that you drive up on, whether it's built into the asphalt or the concrete, that you literally just drive the vehicle over. The system's already wired, and they talk to each other, and it just charges instantly. Do they right. exist now? Yeah. Yep. Do they work? They do. They do. Can I charge my, my entire car 200, 300 mile range overnight with one of those things? Depends on what car you have, mm. but yes. Really? So super cool technology. Um, I'm super excited about where the future of that goes. Absolutely. Right? And more manufacturers get on board, more cars get enabled with that technology. But another thing that we're excited about is called vehicle to grid. And that is a V2G is what they call it. And that's a technology that really hasn't been released yet. But the idea is that if you're at home and you have your electric vehicle and you're, you lose power, you lost power, when that happens, you can actually take the storage, the electricity that's stored in your battery in your car and power up your house. The car becomes my generator, my standby generator? It's like a portable yeah. generator. What can I run though off of my car parked in my garage? The basics, I mean, more than you'd think. Your house, in general, really isn't using that much at any given point. So you can run lights like you normally do. You're not turning every light on your house for the most part. You're going room to room, turning them on and off. Your fridge, which cycles, can run. Yep. Um, if your heating heat, system, if it's gas, water. can run. So right. you guys keep harping on gas heat, meaning no, not electric heat. Correct. Right. And, and presumably not air conditioning for the places that air conditioning. Yeah, nothing too big. You if you know. get a compressor load, you will want to stay away from that because that will draw the battery, drain down, the battery very right quickly, down. Or it might overload it. What about a heat pump, like a mini split that's up on the wall? A lot of those are too much draw. Yeah, yeah. probably not. Okay, but it's gonna keep you going for the Wi-Fi, the lights, the refrigerator. Exactly. Which, and three days, or at least even a couple hours. Just right. get you through that. Get oh, you through the outage. Cool. You are drawing down the car battery, so that if you drive down too low, you might be stranded. You might not be able to drive so your you car anywhere. Pay but attention that you don't. <laughs> the but you get heat, hot water, water versus. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So it's kind of a cool future, right? The idea you drive your car in and it wirelessly charges overnight, it gives you two, three, four hundred mile range of the next day. And in a intermittent power outage, the car is actually working for you, pushing it back to the Acting house. like a generator. That's right. Yeah. That is very cool. All right, guys. Well, thank you. I like the update. In the United States, the average residential insurance claim for water damage is like $10,000. And one of the prime culprits are right here, the basic washing machine hose. Now, in any laundry setup, you're going to have hot water supply, cold water supply. 
shutoffs on each. Now this full city water pressure, and this is just a basic rubber hose. Now the average life expectancy for these hoses, they say is like eight to nine years. So if the units are down here in the basement, it's catastrophic when they let go, but at least the damage is contained to just one local area of the house. But these days, people are opting to try and put the wash and dryer up inside the building. There's obvious reasons for that. It's much more convenient where the dirty clothes get generated and where they get stowed. No more going down those back stairs to the basement. But it comes with additional risks. If those washing machines hoses let go, it can have a disastrous effect on the whole building now. Now we're here on a condominium on the second and third floor of a house, and there's also an owner on the first floor. If this washing machine leaks, it's a big deal. But there are some safeguards against the potential damage from these hoses. Now on this unit right here, they've got a shut up, a hot, and there's a cold. So simple. And guess what? No one ever ever does it. Nobody turns these valves off and they even make a lever one that you can just drop a lever and that takes the pressure off the hoses and they don't turn that off either. To make this installation safe I'm going to add a device called an automatic wash machine shutoff valve. This is a quick acting valve that will open and close. So I'm going to replace this box with this. Now what you've got here is you've got your hot and cold connections right here Here's where our washing machine hoses will adapt. What's different is we're going to take this electrical connection and we're going to plug it into the wall and we're going to take the washing machine electrical plug, plug it into the device. Now, when you ask for the washing machine to come on, then and only then does that electrical current force the valve to open and pressurize the hoses. You use it as you need it for the washing machine. When the washing machine's done, electrical current ends closes the valve again. You don't have to think about it. The pressure is off the hoses and that's safe. <laughs> to replace the valves first I need to shut off the hot and cold going to the upstairs unit. So the old box was right here. You can see where it came down to the drain. I've already cut the hot and cold water lines and the drain. And the new box is bigger. So what I did was to cut this structure away. There was a piece of wood right here that wasn't big enough, so now it is just big enough for this dimension. So I'm going to make these connections. There's a stainless steel clamp. That's that one. Well, it's a relatively small job, but with a really big upside. You get to automatically depressurize the washing machine hoses when you're not using them, and that means peace of mind. Hi, Catherine. Hey, Nathan. Thank you so much for coming. Is this the deck you wrote me about? Yes. So I just moved back home this past year from college. I'm living at my parents' house. I noticed that this beam under our deck has fallen. It seems like a pretty dangerous thing. So I was hoping you could help me fix it up. Well, you call the right guy. There's definitely a problem. We don't want to see a joist laying on the ground under a deck. So let's go underneath. We'll figure out why it happened and how we can fix it. Great. Thanks so much. All right, so first let's go over the parts and pieces that you have. You have your joist here, which should be up there. You have your rim joist on the end. And also you have a ledger board attached to the house. And on top of all of that, you have your pressure treated decking. Got it. And one thing that's missing is actually a hanger that should be holding the end of this joist up. And you actually see that this hanger completely rotted out and the other ones aren't far behind it. Do you guys use this as your main entrance? Yes, we do, and it gets quite slippery in the winter. So do you guys use a lot of salt? Yes. There's your problem right there. The salt's very corrosive and actually rotted right through your hanger and the fasteners. And all your nails are gone except for this one that were going down into your joist. Well, my dad did take a pretty bad fall, so I would like to keep salting if that's possible. It is a necessary evil. I have some alternatives for salting, but first let's get this joist back up into place. I'll go grab some tools and we'll get started. Okay, great. So we don't need too many tools in order to get that joist back up underneath. You have a 2x8 joist, so there's two different hangers you could use. This is for 2x8 and 2x10 joists. Gotcha. 
And this one is for two by six and two by eight joists. So we might as well use the larger of the two. A couple different ways that you could fasten it back to your ledger. We could use these loose hot dip galvy nails. We could do, hit them in with a hammer or we could use this palm nailer in a tight spot. One, one thing I like to do is use screws. These are great, these are structural screws and they're galvanized and these are also great for a tight spot. And since I do a lot of decks, I actually purchased a gun that shoots a galvanized fastener right into the hanger, makes it really quick and easy to do. Okay, so which method are we using? Well, let's do a little bit of a combination. We'll use the large hanger. We can screw it to the ledger board, and then we'll use the gun to toenail the hanger on. Okay. Sound good? Sounds good. Let's do it. All right. So to get started, I actually want to get this joist out of the way. Okay. Then once I have the joists out of the way, I can pop up all the old nails from the top side. You can pull them off with the framing hammer. Got it. All right, move on to the next one. All right, so now that we have the old hanger off, we're ready to put the joist back in. I sighted it and actually it's really straight. So instead of putting it the way it was and where we have all these nail holes, let's flip it over and put it up fresh side up. And then I'm gonna put a prop stick underneath it and we'll get it locked back in. Okay. All right, so let's roll it over. You go up on your end, like that. Okay. All right, now that I have the prop stick underneath, I'm gonna put a few screws in the joist to hold it in place until we get the hanger in. All right, now that we have the joist up in place, we can put the hanger on, the new hanger. It's got a good galvanized coating on it. So that'll slide right up into place. What's great about this model is it has these little fins on them that you can tack in and it'll hold it in place until we screw the sides. All right, so now we're ready to nail it up. So you can see there's a little bit of a tip. You just wanna put that inside that, that hole right there and then hold firmly and pull the trigger. Nice. Do the one above it. There you go, nice job. Now we're gonna switch around to the other side. Make sure it's seated and then pull the trigger. All right, nice shot. Let's take this brace out. So down on this end, we actually don't need to use this style hanger. It'll be kind of tough to incorporate it because it's already sitting on this ledge. The joist is already supported. So okay. instead, we can just use a simple angle bracket and we can set it right on top and screw a nail from both sides. Can clean on your side? Yep. All right, we can slide another one up, tack it in place. We'll, again, we'll screw it and the nail from the sides. Thank you. No problem. Just don't hit my new finger. Now we can reattach the deck boards to the joist that we just reinstalled. These screws are two inches and they have a ceramic coating so they'll help prevent rust. There you go. Nice. All right, Catherine, you're all set. Thank you so much, feels great. Yeah, it's definitely a lot sturdier.
for sure. So we had talked earlier, we know that you like to use salt on your deck and that's fine, but there's some alternatives. We could use magnesium chloride. It's a little bit more expensive, but it's not gonna rust out your hangers and your fasteners. You could also use sand, which is great for traction, but you're not really gonna melt any ice with that. Okay. And the last option is you just could continue to salt it the way you have been, but think of it like your car. On a nice day or in the spring, make sure you get the hose out, clean all the salt off, and it'll last a lot longer. Awesome, thanks so much. You're welcome. All right, getting nice after it in that snowstorm, huh? <laughs> had to. It's a safety issue. You know, we can't just leave that joyous hanging down there. Yeah, and so obviously that was a couple months ago when it was still snowing. Yeah, that was a while ago. Right now is when people should be getting outside, getting under their decks, and checking on their hangers and their fasteners. Yeah, see if anything's loose and getting tightened up. Yeah. All right. So swap it out. Um, you guys spend, you spend a little bit of time talking about proper nails, screws, and such yep. for her. Yeah, I know it's important to use the right hanger and the right fastener. Exactly, and you want to make sure that the fastener is rated, as you said, for the material. Uh, back in 2003 is when they started to change the chemical makeup of the pressure-treated wood because they wanted to take all the arsenic out of it because of all the sawdust and everything when you're using it. And because of the chemical change, you would actually get a galvanic reaction from the hangers and they would rot just like that. From the old hangers, old fasteners. Right. So now the new hangers won't get the galvanic reaction because they're, it's actually a G85 and that's mm -hmm. what you're looking for along with the fasteners. And you want to make sure you use the right fastener for the length or the size of the joist that you're using, whether it's a screw or a nail, you want to use the correct one. Yeah, because yeah, screws, you know, like, people put the wrong screws in all of the time, right? Yeah. right. Know, they're I've, easy to stick in there, but they're not necessarily rated. I've seen people use drywall screws and roofing nails, right. and structurally then it's not strong enough, and they rot, yep. just like the hanger. This is designed that we won't get the chemical reaction. It's also designed for a lot of shear strength. Mm -hmm. And this length is for standard, but when you're using heavy timbers or doubles or stuff like that, you switch up to the longer size. The same with a nail. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure you use the right nail or screw to the size of the member that it's supporting. Yep. Well, you can see why people put it off. I mean, it's no fun working underneath there yes. and getting so the old rotted ones off is not always easy. It's, it's not easy. It takes some time. Um, that's why I like the screws. You know, if someone gets underneath there, they're not really able to drive all these nails and get, on, get in there with a gun and send them home. Yeah, anybody can pull the trigger. So now these are the hangers that I've used because I've had situations where I can't get the old hanger off. I always try to get them off, but I yeah. couldn't get them off. Take a hanger like this. It's extra wide. And it's called for old work with the old joist, when maybe uh, inch and three quarters wider, you need a wider hanger. But this is also used for engineered lumber. And what the nice thing about it is they slip right over the old hanger. Mm -hmm. You don't have to take it off. Mm. But you want to make sure that you nail through every hole. Properly rated hangers and fasteners, and you're off to the races. Exactly. All right, guys, good information. Nice project. Thank no you. And if you've got questions, we've got the experts with the answers. So we'd love to hear from you. Until next time, I'm Kevin O'Connor. I'm Nathan Gilbert. And I'm Tom Silva. For Ask This Old House. We look pretty cold out there. Next time on Ask This Old House. There's a lot of things involved when you paint the room, when you paint for someone else. But a lot of people don't realize that it takes a little time to get what they expect. I'll show you how to update the look of a wood-burning fireplace. Well, this is a notch trowel, just to apply the stucco. We're gonna wanna push it into this wire lab. And we'll head to Montana to build a special space for one of America's bravest.